So how many of you uh, enjoy movies? Anybody? A show of hands. How many of you have seen Infinity War yet? For those of you who haven't seen it, let me tell you what happens in the end. <laughs> just, ki- just kidding. Uh, okay, uh, of movies and talking about movies that have a full franchise sequel deal going on, of the Rocky movies... Uh, there's like six, I believe, Rocky movies, and there's Creed, if you want to count that, that's seven, and then they're making a Creed sequel, if you can imagine, this summer. Uh, so, of all the Rocky movies, tell the person next to you your favorite Rocky movie, your favorite one, one, two, three, you name it. If you don't have a favorite, say, I'm not, in, I'm not into it. Uh, Joe, you've got one, number four, okay, I see that. Okay, how many people said number three? Anybody? Number three, Rocky three? It it is the best. Let me make my case. Um, And spoiler alert, if you've never seen him and you're like, I'm going to go home and rent him today. Okay, Rocky in the first one. uh, He's this uh, kind of unknown dude in Philadelphia training. He gets picked up because they want to do a publicity deal against this reigning champion guy played by Carl Weathers named Apollo Creed in the movie. They go and box and nobody thinks, the people think it's just going to be a blowout, but it's not. It's actually, it's, you know, it's, it's almost a win for Rocky. Then you go into Rocky II, Rocky's got a train, and he actually finally beats Apollo Creed. Sorry, now you can just skip to three. If you don't even need to watch the first two now, I'm saving you money. Uh, number three, uh, enter uh, this guy named Clubber Lang, and uh, also known as, anybody know? Mr. T, right? I pity the fool, huh? come on, bad boy. Uh, he had this kind of rough accent. He wore the feather earring, and he looked rough. And uh, Rocky's trainer uh, said to him, whatever you do, don't fight this guy. He's a wrecking machine. Little, I always liked his trainer, little Burgess Meredith, also Penguin from the old Batman days. And so he's there telling Rocky, don't do it. But Rocky ha- believes uh, his press and thinks he, he's unbeatable. He fights him, and he loses. And he's not used to losing. And he is going through a rough deal. And not only that, he's having a low moment because his trainer dies. And then he has to go in and he's trying to figure out what to pick up the pieces. And who shows up but his, his uh, opponent from the first two movies, Apollo Creed, and says, we could do this together, Rock. We could train together. We can beat Mr. T. He said, with your eye of the tiger. And I'm bringing back some 80s references, right? And, and so he said, we could do it. And then they start training and... Uh, but I want to show you a clip from that movie because I think it relates to today. So check out the screens if you would. Come on, Rock. It's not a game. You want to live in the hospital for five weeks this time? You thought I was tough? This jump will kill you. All right. Come on, come on. Get your head on your shoulders, man. Think about the fight. Think about the fight. Clubber Lang's in here. He's trying to hurt you, Rock. He's trying to hurt you. Okay, here he comes. Jeff, he's Jeff. He's dead! He's trying to hurt you! You gotta fight him! You gotta move! Catch the phrase there? Anybody wrestle with procrastination? Why do today what you can put off for tomorrow? You know, we've been in this series, uh, this is the last week in this series called Dream Killers, and this idea is that God has given all of us a dream. He's created us with purpose and identity, and a lot of times, the, to achieve the purpose, God calls us to the other side of a bridge, as we've been using this illustration. He calls us to live by faith. It says, without faith, without you and I walking the faith bridge, it's impossible to please God. And so I don't know what the dream is, or the decisions, or the, uh, uh, the identity God's calling you to step out in in your life, but it requ- I do know it requires faith. And, and uh, oftentimes, those decisions are very easy for many of us to put off to tomorrow. Say, I'll do it tomorrow. It's just, I'm not sure. A lot of us get caught up. Usually, the idea of procrastination is connected to an excuse. We're either afraid of, I'm not sure what's on the other side. Uh, I'm not sure what's, what, what's gonna happen over there. Uh, I'm, I'm afraid, will this bridge hold me? I'm not sure what it'll look like when I take a step. Or uh, maybe there's some other things that influence our lack of making ability to make a decision today, so we put it off, and that's procrastination. But usually, again, connected to an excuse. I'm not sure, I'm trying not to take it personal that Brian and the rest of the team gave me this message. 
And I have not been able to put anything together yet, so if you give me a minute, I'm going to scribble down some notes. Uh, you know, um, the, the, I, I looked up the word procrastinate in the Bible, and it's not in there. So there wasn't like, I can't do a word study for you on procrastination from the Bible. But uh, what I did find was some characters in the scripture that we might be familiar with who might have wrestled with this uh, idea that a lot of us might wrestle with. How many of you do wrestle with procrastination? Some of you didn't raise your hand because you're still thinking about it, I don't know. <laughs> Just check yes, okay? Uh, and so this idea um, from the scripture, one guy that came to my mind first was a, a guy by the name of Gideon. He's in Judges, if you want to turn there, Judges chapter six, you can turn there. This guy's got, if you ever stayed at a hotel, this guy has Bibles there, he's awesome. So Judges chapter six, what we find is this guy, this character is actually in a situation where Israel is facing off against a, uh, a formidable foe that is uh, highly outnumbering the armies of Israel, and this angel of the Lord shows up, he shows up with Gideon, and he approaches him and says, I want you to lead the charge to fight these guys. But when he shows up, he says to Gideon, he gives him a title, says, Mighty Warrior. And I, I believe, this is my own reading, because I'm, I'm kind of strange, I like to picture stuff. I think if, if we were there, here's what Gideon did. Angel's right here talking to him. I think he did one of these. Where? Was somebody else in the room? Because his response after was, no, no, not me. I'm not a mighty warrior. You got the wrong guy. He then starts to give him the case. They're like, look, whenever we have our little, you know, uh, Israel Olympics and we, we, we face off against the 12 tribes, our tribe comes in last. And if we take the, our tribe and we break it into clans, my clan is always the losing clan in last place. And then he says, and of, of, of the families in the clan, I'm the weakest. I'm not the guy. I like it. You know what I love? The Lord speaking to him through this angel is, doesn't even go, oh, I didn't know. I got, I got the wrong memo. I'll find the other guy. No, no, no. What he, what he didn't realize was his purpose and identity that God was calling him into as a mighty warrior, what, what was on the other side of the bridge for Gideon was, you're gonna fight the Midianites. You are a mighty warrior in Christ. It's not who you are now. It's who he created you to be. It's the dream he's put on your heart, and he starts speaking into his life truth, but he's terrified to cross that bridge. And he gives him a couple small things to do. Go cut down this idol pole and come back, and he's nervous about that and has some fear related to it. A lot of times, fear is related to procrastination. What if I fail? Uh, anybody ever procrastinated in school? Anyone? Right? Um, who, you know, you can procrastinate a test, right? You can procrastinate reading. And you get that every new semester, you're like, oh, this time I'm, I, would do, I would do this thing. I'm totally gonna obey the syllabus. If you actually do the syllabus, the readings when they say, you don't freak out at the end. But then, I, uh, you know, I would go, it'd be mid-semester, like, oh, I'm already behind. Now, if I double the plan. And then by the end, you're like, oh, no, it's two days away, the final. Now if I like just skim it or get the cliff notes. And you could do that with an exam. You can't do that with a paper. How many people in uh, school ever pulled an all-nighter? Anybody? Tell the truth. Tell the truth. You're in church. Okay. Procrastinators. Okay. Now here's Gideon. He's, here's, uh, he's been called to do this. And then uh, the, the Lord speaks to him and says, you now have to go fight Midian. Let's go. And now here's where he's at. He's like, no, 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 not today. Not today. Here's what he says if you're in Judges chapter six, verses 36, 37. Gideon said to God, if you will save Israel by my hand as you've promised, if you're really, if it's really you speaking, now some of us do this, we wonder, is that really the Lord putting this on my heart? I don't know if it's his voice or mine. And he's wondering now, he's second guessing himself. If this is really you saying it, I'm gonna ask you a favor. I'm gonna put my fleece jacket out tonight, okay? I'm gonna take my fleece, I'm gonna drop it on the threshing floor. There's an open roof. I know every morning dew drops there and everything's covered and wet. So he says, here's the challenge, Lord, if it's really you. Um, tomorrow morning, if there is dew only on my fleece jacket and, and all of the ground around it is dry, because that's not even normal, there's gonna be, it's gonna be a wet ground. Only the Lord can do this, keep the dry ground. He said, then I will know that you will save Israel by my hand and I'll do it tomorrow. And so uh, I love this about the Lord. He doesn't, he doesn't get frustrated with him. He said, okay. I mean, how hard is that for the Lord? Hey, stop the do. Hey, whoever's doing the do tomorrow, cut that off. Let's <laughs> dial that. But someone go down and soak his, soak his jacket. 
And then what we read, if you read the scripture, it says he came out and he got his jacket, everything was dry, and he found his jacket. It said he rang it out and then it filled an entire bowl with water. Wasn't a little bit, of, wasn't sprinkled, wasn't damp. It was soaked. I love that about the Lord. The Lord's either, Lord's always crossed the bridge. He's always all in. And he calls us, invites us with him. So he's like, okay, Gideon, you ready? That Gideon's probably a little more like you and me. Now it's tomorrow. It is tomorrow, and he's not doing it. Uh, it, we go to verse 39. Then Gideon said to God, you know, don't be angry with me. Hey, how many of you have kids? If, kids, if my kids come to me, that's the opening line, it's always gonna be bad. Please don't be angry with me. What, 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 what did you wreck? Is my car, my, you've wrecked something. You know, they're about to say something. That's his opener with the Lord. Don't be mad. Don't be upset with me. Hey, listen, uh, let me make one more request if possible. Allow me one more test with this fleece deal, okay? This time, it's kind of, we're gonna do a quick reversal, a little dyslexic thing. Uh, he said, but by, by this time, I want, this time I want you to uh, keep my fleece dry, but soak the ground. Everything's wet, but the fleece. Now that would be impressive, Lord. And you almost think the Lord's like, okay. Angel on that last night, reverse please, okay? And so he sends the order, and it says, the next, that night, God did so. And the next morning, only the fleece was dry and all the ground was covered with dew. And, he got, and, and you gotta give it to uh, Gideon at this point. He's been procrastinating. Now it's the next day, now it's the next day. And he's like, okay, let's do it. Hey, what are your excuses? I mean, when you think about it, there's other guys in the Bible just like him. Moses, remember at the burning bush? I, I got a popular message for you, Moses. Go back and you tell Pharaoh to release the free labor force. The one that's building the pyramids and the sphinxes and all that stuff. You tell him to let him go. I don't want to do that. And then he starts with his excuses. I don't know your name. What if they don't believe me? I'm not a good communicator. What are your excuses? As kind of a way to be, you know, kind of juxtaposed to these two fellas, who do we have on the other side? We got, we got guys like Noah. And we're told in Genesis chapter six that Noah, that all of the earth kind of became corrupt, that the sin of Adam and Eve had trickled down and it had such an impact on all of humanity that people turned their backs on God, everybody. And said the Lord, when he opened up in uh, Genesis chapter six, the only guy the Lord could find that was following, that was crossing the bridge to be with the Lord was Noah and his family. So the Lord showed up and said, I, I'm gonna give you a challenge. I'm about to flood the planet. I'm about to push the reset button. And here's, here's the other side of the bridge for you, Noah. I want you to do something crazy. Nobody's done this. You're gonna build an ark. It's gonna be huge. Your neighbor's gonna mock you. It's gonna take most of the rest of your life. You're gonna have to involve your kids. You're not getting paid for it. Listen, I need you to build it. What do you say? And there's, by the way, there's no close body of water, so it's really gonna be silly. And you can go to Kentucky and see they've, they've actually, there's a group that actually re, they built the ark to the exact specifications the Lord said. And he said even down to the, the type of wood, gopher wood. And I love this. Is Genesis 6 verse 22 says this. Noah did everything just as the Lord commanded him. Not, not an ounce of procrastination in the guy. Okay. Let me get my toolbox. I'll be back. What, what, what's up with that? There's other guys like him. Do you remember, uh, so the other side for him was the, uh, hey, how about Abraham? I want you, I know you're comfortable where you are, I know you are, but I want you to move to the other side, to a land you don't even know about. I'm gonna take care of you. Abraham, there's no complaint, there's no Gideon Moses thing there. It's like, okay. Uh, I mean, uh, what, what is, what, and then he calls him over, hey, you've been waiting your whole life for a son, I finally gave him to you, sacrifice him. Hey, how about crossing the bridge on that one? Can you imagine? Hey, if you caught it, what, he didn't say, okay, if I wake up tomorrow and my son has soaked the bed, I'll know you're, he didn't do the soak thing. He didn't do the what's your name. I tell you, if I was gonna do it on something, it'd be having to put my son to death. No, early the next morning, he's on it. He's not a procrastinator. How about you and me? When the Lord calls us to do something, are we quick to answer or do we have excuses? Is the first response, well, I don't know if that's you. Oftentimes, uh, here's, here's the danger of this, by the way. Oftentimes, you and I, we make it these huge spiritual things, like I'm waiting for the big ark for me to build or the big whatever. Uh, yeah, let me, let me, some of you are like, I haven't taken an encounter, I don't know how to hear. The Holy Spirit's present for all of us. 
Whether you took encounter or advanced encounter, the Lord is present this morning and he wants to speak to us. Some of us are not sure if it's him. But oftentimes, if you're trying to figure it out, I got a quick grid for you to put it through. It, it always, always falls into two categories. It has to do with relationship, either loving the Lord or loving people. So if you hear something sometimes like, I think I should, like, I, I, let me give you an example. I was pushing a cart at Wegmans, and I don't know where you push your cart, whether, I, sometimes it's Harris Teeter, sometimes it's, I'm at Wegmans the other day, and I was only there because my daughter was at this deal, and I'm trying to kill time while she's at a job interview, and I'm pushing the cart, and I get, and I've got to pick her up in a minute, and I get to the little pay place, and there's a lady in front of me, and I thought, if I'm hearing from the Lord correctly, talk to her. But I, I didn't want to procrastinate. I'm like, oh, just, you know, Lord, my wife wants me home. I got some dinner stuff tonight, and I got to pick my daughter up, and I ignored it. I ignored it. I, I felt like God saying, it was a little thing. Just talk. Just love this person. I'm like, eh, okay, and then the lady, she beat me to it. She said, hey, you got some fish there. How are you going to cook that tonight? I'm like, okay. <laughs> Game on. Here we go. Uh, I said, uh, well, you know, I don't cook a lot of fish, but, uh, you know, at Wegmans, they put it on a little board for me. I got to put it on the grill. And she's like, you know, and then she, you know, some people, it's like not even the work, right? God set me up. She said, hey, you know, the best seafood I used to have was in California. I, when I lived there, I'm like, where'd you live in California? She said, San Diego. I'm like, okay. <laughs> uh, you know, I work in San Diego a couple times a year with the homeless. Really? What do you do? And I said, well, this is going to sound weird. I live with them. She said, that, that is weird. Uh, she said, why would you do that? And I said, well, my best friend from this area ended up homeless. I started looking for him. And it just, it's, uh, it, I've been crossing the bridge since, okay? And I'm, I'm trying to explain it to her. And she said, oh, gosh, I wish, I wish this was written down and I could read it. I'm like, well, as a matter of fact, <laughs> I, I wrote a book about it called 99 for One. Why, where can I get it? Amazon. And she's like, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go home and get it right now. She's like, how will I remember? I'm like, it's right here. Um, and <laughs> Uh, honestly, uh, I was so moved, and I don't know what the Lord wanted to do in, through that, but I know he put it on my heart, and it wasn't a big thing, it was just a conversation. And I'm telling you, then the lady I'm checking out, she's finished her thing, but she's waiting with her cart, wants to finish the conversation. And I was like, no, you can go. We're uh, and then as I'm, I finished paying, and the girl doing my register goes, I'm gonna get the book too. I'm like, oh, look at you. You know the funny thing about the bridge is when you and I take a step of faith and just have a conversation with somebody and start living out our purpose, which is to love the Lord and love people, God starts drawing other people in. There's other people. The bridge gets wider. You start crossing in faith, and all of a sudden the Lord starts inviting others into it as we start living out our purpose, and you can't even see how far those splinters go. The end goal is not get them in seats in a church building. The end goal is get them in the kingdom by love. How are we doing with that? If we're procrastinating that, then shame on us. Shame on me. I need, I have those opportunities every day. I'm sure I miss them. You know why? Because it's very simple. It's just loving people. Have you noticed there's a lot of people in this area? They're everywhere. They're like, I mean, they're doing construction now on Loudoun County Parkway. I tried to go all, I went all the way around the other day. My daughter's like, was that really quicker? I'm like, I don't know, but I kept moving. Uh, but the people are the ones in the cars in front of us that are going slow. And the, and the guy gives us an opportunity to love them. It's the guy in the orange jacket that's like stopping my traffic. God wants me to love that guy. It's the, it's the dude that doesn't see the green light because he's on his goofy phone. And then I got to love him with a honk, you know? <laughs> Do you know these people? Hey, you're God's answer to love them. Uh, oftentimes, the other side of the bridge is as simple as just love them. But I gotta make time to love people. Uh, I gotta make time for Christ so his love comes through me. If I don't make time for the Lord, for the spirit to work in me, I got nothing to give. I can't, pro hey, anybody procrastinate their time with the Lord? I do sometimes, I'll do it later. Why, why do you say morning quiet time's good? Just so you don't miss it. Just start with him. And I don't even think of it as a quiet time anymore. I think it's a conversation. I think he wants to be included throughout the day. Uh, you know, some of us with this idea, we, we um, have, have a problem because we're right with procrastination. We've been using this bridge a lot. If you're a procrastinator, you, you might be right here. I don't even want to get on a bridge. 
And some of us are held up because something that's happened in our past. There's some scar, you tried to help somebody at some time and you got burned. And you're still soaking over it. You're still like, man, I, I tried doing it and I, I gave money to somebody and they, they didn't do what they said with it. I tried doing this and man, people stabbed me in the back. Here's what Paul has to say while he's sitting in a prison cell writing to the church at Philippi. He says this, brothers and sisters, I don't consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. Like I didn't fully ground, you know, I'm not fully arrived yet. He says this, but one thing I do, get, get this line, forgetting what is behind. How you doing with that? Uh, forgetting what, he said, I strain to what's ahead, I press on towards the goal, the prize on the other side of the bridge for which God's called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. But I, I need to forget what's behind. Sometimes the past is an anchor. Some of us have some scars or somebody wounded us and it's killing us. And the enemy's having a field day with you because you don't move forward on the bridge because you're hung up with that junk. God's like, let me sever that thing and walk. It's not, it's a freedom to walk, not to sit there and lick your wounds. And the Lord can bring healing that nobody else can bring. If we invite him, if we don't fall for the enemy's lie that don't cross, don't cross, you'll get burned again. You, I, I, I submit this, you won't live until you cross. Truly living is on the bridge. That's where he calls us to live. We'll cross and then he's gonna give you another bridge. You know what's on the other side of the bridge is another bridge. Oh, now some of you are like, no, I definitely don't wanna do it. Uh, <laughs> for some of us, it's not the past, it's the future. Uh, if, if you wrestle with control, anybody wrestle with control? Some of you didn't raise your hand because I'm like, I'm not gonna raise my hand because he said to. You, you definitely wrestle with control, okay? Uh, so this idea of crossing the bridge is the fear of what's on the other side, and I can't control what's over there, and I don't know what's coming on the other side. And for those of us that wrestle with worry and thinking about the future, and some of us, like, in a split second can, like, analyze everything that might go wrong, Right? There's a scene in Infinity War, it's not a, I'm not gonna wreck anything, when, when uh, Doctor Strange is doing this weird little trance thing, like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm evaluating how many options there are in the future and which ones will work out. And some of us do that in a split second. We try to analyze everything that might happen on the other side of the bridge, and it terrifies us, and so we stop. And Jesus, speaking in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, says, for those of you that wrestle with worry, what are you gonna wear, what are you gonna eat, what might happen? He says, let it go. He said, here's, here's, here's my plan for your life. Seek first, Matthew 6, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and everything else will work out. And then he says, don't worry about tomorrow. Today is sufficient for itself. Like, don't, don't worry about tomorrow. You just have to do it today. If you only focus on crossing the bridge and loving Christ today, you did it. My, my oldest sister is, uh, has been going to AA for years. She's been sober for years. And I once asked her about her struggle, and she said to me, you know, Will, we have this phrase one day at a time. I said, what's that mean? Talk to me. I've seen the bumper sticker. And she said, uh, here's what it means. If I don't drink today, I win. She said, if I worry about the office party coming up and New Year's Eve deal and something else and the barbecue up the street and all the other, I'm probably gonna get so overwhelmed, I might just take a drink today. But if I, my, my goal, if I just don't drink today, I win. You know, I would say that's the same philosophy Jesus is saying. If you just seek Jesus today and step across the bridge today, you did it. Don't beat yourself. Well, I haven't done that in the past. Who cares? Forget what's behind. But tomorrow, but tomorrow the Lord's inviting us to say, hey, uh, will you step out and trust me? You know, will you? So let's, let's talk about some opportunities in that area. You know, Mike, Mike, uh, Trivet, I asked him, send me a few ideas for some of us who are like, I want to do something. I want to step across the bridge and love and serve others and do it in community. But I just, I'm not that creative. Well, uh, Mike said, here's a couple ideas you could pray about. One is there's a, uh, connected to the Accelerate deal we're all doing, there's a uh, service project work day on May 19th. And he's got a table right outside. You can go out in the foyer and say, Mike, sign me up or at least give me the info. And get signed up. Some of you right now are already dialing up some excuses. Well, I think I have some. Right? I can't cross the bridge because I'm like, just pray about it. Don't do what I'm saying. That's the Holy Spirit. I don't, you, know, you don't answer to me or Brian or anybody on the teaching team. 
You might answer your spouse, but you know, you answer the Lord. He's the one that invites us across the bridge, and if he's putting it on your heart, do it. I'm just gonna give you a couple ideas. Another one is, there's a food packing event coming up June 3rd. You wanna sign up for that? It's right out there. There's also, some of you have never been on a mission trip. Some of you are like, one day, I'm definitely gonna do it. And you procrastinate that. I don't have a passport. You know they, they give them out to people that go apply? <laughs> if you're even thinking about it, why not get the passport today? You know? So, so uh, you get that, you go, you, a lot of you, um, you know, maybe you've been to Nicaragua and you're like, I only do Nicaragua. You know, a few years ago, I would lead teams in Nicaragua and I just, uh, at some point, I remember one of the kids on the way home said, God's really moving in Nicaragua. I only go there. I'm like, and that bothered me. I'm like the next year we're doing other trips. We're gonna add other trips because God actually is moving all over the planet. That's just one place. Uh, I'll give you one example from Peru. Uh, we're actually uh, taking a trip together to Peru this summer. And uh, the, this trip we've been doing for five years, and just tell you a little of the backstory with it. Uh, some of you who were here last year might remember, we talked about, uh, we, my wife invited me one time, and I said, let's just do it once. I was doing it, her dad is from uh, Peru, so I was like, okay, we'll do the Peru trip. And then I was just thinking that was it, I was off the hook. I only had to cross the bridge once. That's how the Lord gets you, by the way, sometimes. You do the once, and he's like, oh, I got more for you, come on. And, and so, uh, we went over, and then, then we fell in love with the people. So at this place, this site that was started by uh, uh, a gringo from uh, San Antonio, Texas, went out and started this because he was an oil tycoon, and when oil ran out in Texas, he started looking at South and Central America, and, and he got sucked down there and met a missionary who led him to Christ. Then he, fell so, he said, I fell in love with Jesus over the money from the oil. He said, and then I just started doing missions, and God put it on his heart one day to start this orphanage 20 years ago. So a, a gringo from Texas starts an orphanage that's booming right now. And they have a farm, a huge farm, that last year sold 30,000 avocados, 12 different varieties. And this is amazing stuff. And there's this orphanage on there where they care for 30 to 40 kids that have horrific past. And then they have a school that, uh, that is a whole other kingdom story that they built that's got over th about 300 kids. And we're, we're gonna go serve there, walk alongside them. We've been taking groups the last few years. But uh, while we're there, you know, kind of along the way, we cross it, and then we go again, then we go. Then I started falling in love with the people. And uh, one of the guys, Pastor Benny, I talked about him last year, he found out his son, Manassas, had leukemia when his son was three years old. And they battled cancer, and we'd stop in, because God put him on our heart, and we'd stop by. When we were coming back from another mission trip, we'd say, let's route through Peru and see them. And then last year, we went to be with them because Manassas passed away at the age of five, and, and at the end of our mission trip, I said to my wife, Sandra, as we're praying, I feel like what the Lord's calling us to is stay an extra four days and just love the family. Let's just grieve with them. Jesus said, mourn with those who mourn. Let's do it. Let's just go sit with them. And they have an older son, ben uh, uh, Benjamin. So we went into Cusco and we sat with them for about four days. And that was not like a fun trip. It was rough to relive it and hear them cry and, and, and how horrific their life is. We just entered into it with them. But that was the bridge for us at that point. And then while we were there, I had somebody ping me from uh, Facebook that said, hey, I see you're there, I'm with Young Life. We have a Young Life team in uh, Peru. Would you meet them? Would you go ahead and meet them? Uh, and I said, oh yeah, I could, I could do that. And so we met them, and they said, we're just looking for leaders. Now when we asked Benny and Mousy, I think we have an image of them, uh, we asked them, how are you doing with healing? Somewhere there's an image. Uh, there, okay, or not. Um, there, there it is. We were invited over to their family room, and he said, oh, by the way, while we've been healing, we started inviting over orphans from the last 20 years that have graduated who are just sitting in Cusco. And I said, can I bring these Young Life people I just met? So I brought the Young Life, the, the gal on the lower left there is, uh, works with Young Life there, and they said, gosh, we just need leaders. So we kind of put that together, and they said, we could train these young people to do Young Life and to get connected into ministry if only we had the funds. And I came back here and pitched it last year, and, and people right here paid for all those kids to go. Every one of those kids went and served with kids that didn't know the Lord. It was unbelievable. That was just along the way. And then while we were there, uh, over the course of that time, my daughter Courtney was there. Courtney told me the year earlier, she's the one on the far right in the purple, uh, she actually um, came to me and said, you know, Dad, I feel like for me crossing the bridge, God's called me to take a group of my college friends out to Peru and serve there. And I said, okay, do it, and she did. And these are her friends that came, and the girl just on her left is Becca Harrison. Becca Harrison was graduating from college with her up in, uh, was, was going to school with her up in Chicago. Becca says, 
Will, I have this dream. For me, the dream on the other side of the bridge is that I, uh, I wasn't sure, but after two months in Peru, I would like to, to go after the kids up in Cusco that have nothing. And I want to do coffee ministry to teach them a trade and disciple them as they work. I'm like, that's unbelievable. Then she says to me, Becca, right there in the blue, says, well, you know, for me, well, I, I'm going to go learn coffee because I don't know it. So she said, I've signed on for a coffee internship at Radford, Virginia. I go, okay. And so I'm just kind of listening. She says, uh, I said, who leads it? And she said, this couple named Eric and Barbara Johnson. Who used to be on staff here at CFC? I'm like, okay, Lord. And the bridge kept getting wider as other people are invited in and crossing. And then while we talked to her, the Johnsons contact me and said, we should talk about this because I think God's doing something bigger. I'm like, okay, but we couldn't find it in our schedule to make it down to Radford and they couldn't make it up. So it just so happens when one of our bridge crossings was me to go, uh, was, I felt like the Lord called me to go to Hawaii last year to look for my friend Ed, who I found out was no longer in San Diego. And I, I found out that on that same week, on that same island, the Johnsons are like, we're gonna be there that week because we're thinking about opening a coffee shop there. I'm like, what? So next slide, that's us with the Johnsons in Hawaii. God just kept dropping different things in our path. When you and I cross the bridge, God has this creative way of letting that, those decisions to love others just kind of splinter out and impact others. And now she's finishing the internship to go back and lead this. And it's kind of unbelievable what the Holy Spirit is setting up now at the orphanage, now up in Cusco and beyond. And he does this with all of us, if what? If we're willing to cross the bridge. If you don't put off for tomorrow the decisions God's putting on your heart today, when the Holy Spirit says stop and love this person, stop and go serve there, stop and sign up for that, stop and get your passport. But you know, I've given a lot of missional examples because that's kind of my heartbeat. But for others of us, you know what the other side of the bridge is? Uh, You got a marriage that's in trouble. And it actually would be easier for you to serve than for you to go to a counselor's office with your spouse. And for you, the Lord's saying, make the appointment. Your relationship will not get better on its own. Cross the bridge, make the appointment. I can't afford it. You can't afford not to. For others of you, you have a kid that's in trouble at home, but you're slammed at work. And for you to cross the bridge, the Lord's saying, take a couple vacation days and go out with your kid. Just be with them. Nothing substitutes that, right? You can buy them all the cool stuff, uh, you know, that this planet has to offer, it won't be anything compared to your presence. Maybe for you, the bridge is that. Maybe for you, you have a relationship that has not been reconciled at the office or maybe in this building or at another. Maybe you came to this church because you, you had an altercation at another church that sent you here. And the Holy Spirit this morning has put it on your heart to say, you know what the bridge is on the other side of the bridge? Call the person. Own it. Love them. Well, I wasn't the one responsible. You know, some of us try to get off the hook on this whole love thing because the Lord says, you know, love one another. And you're like, okay, I'll love one another. Then we try to define who the one another is, the people in my circle that I love. But the Lord knows us, right? Then he's like, love your neighbor. I'm gonna get you out of the another. I want you to go next door. Ugh. And then if you're like that religiously, you're like, who's my neighbor? Mm, you're difficult. So the Lord just says, I'm just gonna include, love your enemy. That's everybody. I got everybody on the list. There's nobody you're off the hook for. If you harbor hatred or anger or bitterness towards any human on the planet, here's what the Lord says. Leave, you know, we're about to come and do communion in a minute. Leave the offering table and go make it right. Then come back and worship. God doesn't want our token gift if we're carrying bitterness in our heart. He can't allow the flow of the spirit to flow freely without when we block it up like that. I don't know what it is for you, but I know there's something for every one of us. I know there's something on the other side of the bridge for every individual in this room and who's watching on Facebook. And if we are willing to be bold enough to stop right here and invite the Holy Spirit right now and say, Lord, speak to me. You make it clear and I'll cross. And if you're unsure, here's, here's what I tell you. If, if, it has to, if whatever comes to your mind has to do with loving another person or the Lord, you got nothing to lose. Right? I think here you're not even living. I'm going to invite the band back up now. And, and what I'd like you to do is every one of us stop and invite the Spirit to speak because He's present. 
And maybe first you invite the Lord. God, we invite you to speak to each and every one of us about maybe the excuses that we present before you that we believe justify us waiting another day. But in the words of uh, Apollo Creed, there is no tomorrow. Lord, if there is uh, an excuse we have, reveal to us that you are so much bigger than any excuse, so much greater than any fear, so much bigger than any financial crisis. Lord, show us now what's on the other side of the bridge of faith. Help us have the courage to step out and trust you. And as we do, that we might have the privilege of seeing your spirit alive and at work. We might have the privilege of seeing the work, just the work of your spirit splinter as the kingdom of of God grows. Use us. If there's some of us you're calling to go to the table, I pray we might just drive Mike Trivet crazy today with so many people at that table signing up, he's not sure what to do about it. Help us have the guts to follow your spirit and live the, the life and the dream you've invited us to. In Jesus' name, amen.